Welcome to Alt Swift X's A Cocker Bridge with episode ten uh, of 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 season two of 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 the Swifto show, in which we're analyzing I uh, three, the third I uh, chapter. Welcome all to the chat. It's been a little while. It's been it's been a minute since the last Alt Swift X episode. The pace has been slow, I confess. But you know what? So is Game of Thrones. So is A Song of Ice and Fire. It's a slow-moving beast. Um, it's it's geriatric, it's got creaky knees, uh, but it's doing its best to creep along. And that's what this chapter is like. This chapter's a very sort of slow travelogue up uh, up north, not even on the King's Road. This is not an efficient travelogue. This is this is the scenic route. This is where George slows down and like points out the sights, and it's like a Di- it's like a Disneyland ride or something, where it's like on the left you'll witness this terrible burned village showcasing the horrors of war. If you look out the right, you'll see Arya hitting a rabbit with a stick. Um, it's, it's just, you're meant to soak it in, it's like a bath. This chapter is like a bath, because you just sit back and you just soak in the themes, the tones, the sense, the emotion of anxiety and darkness and progress through a, a uncertain time. That's sort of what's happening in this chapter, much like, indeed, Splash Mountain, uh, Chikaris Blackfire says. How does Disneyland work? Like, Splash Mountain, does that, is that a ride at, like, multiple Disneylands? Is there multiple, and, like, Pirates of the Caribbean? Like, all those, like, classic Disney rides, do they all exist in multiple Disneylands at once? Uh, Or is there only one Splash Mountain and only one, like, of each of those? Or or is it, like, an interconnected wormhole situation? Like, if if you stand in the queue, if you step through into Pirates of the Caribbean in Disneyland Anaheim... Uh, do you go to the? Does it? Is this a space-time wormhole to like the one parts of the Caribbean that can also be visited from like Euro Disney and can also be visited from Disneyland Tokyo? Does that? Do they all interconnect? Um, there's only one way to find out. Uh, Di, the resident Disney expert, will have to will have to tell us. Um, I've got Disney questions, but we'll get back to this. Because, of course, a cocker bridge will not be slowed down by tangents. A cocker bridge will not be led astray. Uh, this is... This is... A cocker bridge. Okay, so we're gonna start. And, um, this is definitely one of the less eventful chapters. This is one of the less, uh, momentous, memorable chapters. Uh, Aya is, of course, with Yorin, the wandering crow of the Night's Watch, uh, who is trying to get Aya to Winterfell, along with a bunch of Night's Watch recruits on their way to the Wall. Um, and if we know anything about Aya's arc, it's that things don't go as planned, and people die, and darkness happens, and Aya gets dehumanized, and that's the journey that she's walking. Uh, but the first line is that the road is little more than two ruts through the weeds. Uh, because they're avoiding the King's Road. The King's Road is the main road built by our pal King King Jaehaerys the Wise. Um, uh, but the King's Road's full of all these gold cloaks who are hunting after Gendry. Um, and so Yorin, in his infinite wisdom, has decided to go, go, go bush and uh, go on all the, you know, the goat, tracks and the and the all the winding ways and the dirt bits and so on so that's what they're doing and um there's not much traffic which is good because there aren't many people to report them to the popo um and uh and the human flood that's flowing down the king's road is only a trickle here and human flood is an interesting term. It's it's kind of dehumanizing to lump individuals together into a flood, which is something that is faceless and 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 fungible. Word of the day: fungible. Fungibility. Oh man, I could tell you a thing or two about fungibility. If I recall rightly, something is fungible when it is like equally exchangeable for something else. 
Uh, so like, so like, uh, uh, gas, fuel, petrol for a car is fungible because one liter of fuel is just as good as any other liter of fuel, or uh, or, or or one one bucket or, or 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 one milk jug or whatever you Imperials um use, um damn Imperials. Uh, the fun- fungibility is is a thing, and uh, I think that 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 floods are fungible and therefore the humans within them are fungible and that's just that's that ain't right no the, but but if a flood a human flood is like an apocalyptic sort of a concept i think it's like a biblical deluge or something right because this is an apocalyptic scenario almost this is a war this is, these are people displaced these are people suffering and being th- sloshed about the world um people do have you seen those simulations when they're designing like stadiums and stuff, uh, they do uh, like these like particle physics simulations where they have like these computer simulations of just like these blobs moving around and like bumping into walls and things. And, 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 and what it's simulating is how crowds of people move. Like you can like 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 digitally simulate if you put a crowd in a in a space, a physical space that's shaped in a certain way, um, how will people move and respond like if there's a fire and everyone or if just everyone's trying to get through a certain entrance like if we put like it's stuff like if we put a pillar in this place in this stadium exit it'll actually get people to leave the stadium more efficiently like it's stuff like that it's all these like specifics and all these like fine things about how you design sh- spaces that can change the way people move and i guess my point is that like people kind of do move like a flood people kind of do move like a liquid um on mass have you read foundation by isaac asimov foundation has um this this idea of like uh oh, someone tell me in the chat what it's called it's like uh historiography or history science or like it, it, it there's this term for uh the predictability of humans when they're in large numbers like it's almost impossible to predict what an individual person will do in any given situation but it is possible to uh to predict what a civilization or what a world will do like once you sort of average out all that individual variability you can predict what like what like a country of people will do what a population of people will do that's like what like public health is right like individual medicine is great and dandy you can give like you know a pill there and a and a jab there and whatever but that's and but that's not always an effective way to make a population of people healthy what's often better is like public health measures that affect like a whole group of people at once that can that can have you can predictably affect a population by doing things like hey we'll put fluoride in the water hey we'll put up billboards that say that smoking will will make your balls shrivel up but like there's all sorts of like public health measures that affect populations as a whole that that, that that is more predictable than if you try and affect people on an individual level psychohistory thank you doomsday psychohistory is what they call it in foundation it's the idea of affecting populations in a way that's more manageable and effective than trying to manage a whole bunch of individuals uh acupuncture glider says probably the same thing anyway um uh, the, yeah so the point of all of that being that the, the the idea of a human flood i think connects to that idea of 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 on a macro level people being like a mass, like a physical entity that can be, you know, like c- c- canaled and diverted and and shaped by forces like that. Um, but yes, of course, uh, there are no tangents here on Alt Swift X. Thanks for reminding me, Schubert. Um, let's move on to sentence four. The road winds back and forth like a snake. It tangles with smaller trails. It vanishes entirely only to reappear later once they had all but given up hope. And Arya hates it. So Arya is here on a uh, long and winding road, um, which is not only true physically of where she is now, I think it's true in a more general sense about her story. Like, Arya, at the beginning of book two, her goal is to get to Winterfell, and by book, by the end of book five, she's still not there. 
Uh, Arya's road is indeed long and winding. Uh, ben Keeler says that uh, Psycho History is one of Asimov's more fun plot devices because it breaks down when it comes to individuals. So no matter what Psycho History predicts, protagonists acting on their own are immune. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how we like to think, isn't it? Because I think, like, it, it, it is unavoidably true that, yeah, like, populations are predictable. When you, when you light a fire in a cinema, people run out. Um, uh, and, and when you, that there are, there are ways to manipulate holes, but we all like to think that, that as individuals, we are still free, which is paradoxical, right? Like how can humanity as a whole be predictable, but humans as individuals not be predictable? Um, that doesn't necessarily make sense, but we all like to believe it, don't we? Um, I guess it's necessary for stories, isn't it? Stories, um stories and the way the whole way humans think like they're all founded on the assumption of individual agency um but we all but we also want to live in like this deterministic world that operates by rules and principles and 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 stuff um there might be paradoxes in how we think about these things anyway um uh, all right all right all right so uh so Aya hates this this road that she's on and we get all these descriptions of, of meadows and woodlands and, and valleys and, and willows, which reminds me a lot of uh, some of the more boring parts of The Lord of the Rings. Like, The Lord of the Rings, like, don't get me wrong, love it, love it. But there's a lot of descriptions of fucking hills. Like, oh, and, 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 and the rills were, were, were especially really in this part of, of Gondolin. Uh, some of these beaches were were of an unusually intense beige color on on the western side of the hill. Uh, in comparison, the eastern side of the hill had had, had more of a cream color to the bark. Um, and on the northern side, I, I'd 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 characterize it as a sort of a parchmenty off white. W whereas on, on on the south side of the hill, it was just a, just a very pale brown. Very, very pale brown to the beech trees on that. Like, like Tolkien goes on like that for a long ass time. Um, and yeah, they break into elven songs all the time, reggae. So yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, and so this feels very uh, Middle Earthian uh, to me. Uh, Nicolay says, "Is the rills not part of the North in A Song of Ice and Fire?" Yeah, I think don't the uh, Rizwells live in the rills in the North in Game of Thrones? I think every fantasy world has rills. Um, it's kind of... An what the fuck is a rill? All right, I'm going to Google this. Uh, rills. The, um, all right, a rill is a small stream. Oh, I didn't know that. A shallow channel cut in the surface of soil or rocks by running water. A low German word. Oh, and the word rill in astronomy is also used for a fissure or a narrow channel on the moon's surface. Ain't that cool? So what, do we have the rills of, of the moon and the canals of Mars? They're all dug by the reptilians, of course. You'll know about that. Um, Glider says it's a lil river. Maybe that's where the word comes from. Lil river, rill? River, lil, rill? Uh, maybe that's how it works. Uh, Kathy Sinister has to go and be a mummy now. Uh, have fun, Kathy. Don't be too sinister about it. Um, all right, anyway. So, um... So there's reels. Gotta love the reels. Arya doesn't, however. Arya is not a great appreciator of reels, and that's a shame. Anyway, so 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 this story trundles along this first page, and we're told that it's the wagons that are slowing them, lumbering along, axles creaking under the weight of their heavy loads. And I tend to think, like when I read that, I think of George Martin. I think of this as a metaphor for George Martin's writing. Like, the slowness of Aya's journey here is, I think, the slowness of George's writing. Because think of it, like, you know, George lumbering along, his axles creaking. I'm imagining George Martin's bones creaking under the weight of their heavy loads. I'm sure George is dropping some heavy loads and um and there's and this paragraph describes like like these wagons that Joran's party is driving um they they're going along this like narrow rutted road and as they're going along they come face to face with another carriage that's that's coming from the opposite end some someone else with a wagon pulled by oxen and because the road is narrow and it's just a couple of ruts 
th- they can't pass each other. So what they have to do is is the other cart has to unhitch the oxen, put them to the back of the cart, turn it around, and and reverse, you know, beep, 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 as the oxen are, like, backing up. And they have to, like, walk backwards and have to wait. And and so there's this whole paragraph about this maneuver of, like, th- this, this one-way road having to get people past each other. And holy hell... Like surely that's a metaphor for the for the insane inefficiency of uh, George Martin's writing style, right? Because George Martin describes like writing a chapter and then writing some more chapters, then rewriting the first chapter because something that he did changed it. And he talks about you know the Miranese knot, where in Dance with Dragons he had to like think totally rewrite all these different chapters, all these moving pieces, and, mo- and shuffle them around and go backwards and forwards and two steps forwards and two steps back and two steps diagonal diagonal and two steps orthogonal and just just stepping all over the place just totally rambling inside out loop-de-loop inefficient road um and i think that's how george martin writes and i think that's how i uh, travels right now that's the point that i'm trying to make in a rambling back and forth lateral orthogonal diagonal sort of a way page two <laughs> um all right, so Aya uh, cannot help looking over her shoulder. Aya is anxious um, because of the gold cloaks that are just behind them, just about to catch her. Aya is is constantly anxious and being pursued and hunted for like her whole storyline. Ever since she left King's Landing, uh, ever since she left the Red Keep. Uh, she's been in danger, and people have been hunting her down, and she's never been relaxed. And I don't know what's going to happen when and if Aya gets in a situation when she can relax again. Like, it's like with Aya in the TV show in Season 7, arriving at Winterfell, and when Aya finally gets to a place of relative safety, she finally gets reunited with her family, she finally comes home to Winterfell, she immediately starts, like, picking fights with Sansa, which, you know, was ridiculous, but also might, like... Like, what else is Arya going to do? If Arya is so, like, conditioned to be constantly paranoid, constantly suspicious, constantly stressed, like, it's like a beaten dog. It's like a, like, it's like a mental wiring. It's like, 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 can she relax ever again after these formative years of being on edge all the time, constantly surrounded by people who want to hurt her? I think given all of that, it is, like, fairly believable that she would lash out unnecessarily at people like Sansa. I think it makes sense that she wouldn't be able to relax, and I think that's why she won't, you know, marry Gendry and become a noble lady. I think that's why Arya has to either go adventuring off on her own into some sort of dangerous adventure, or she has to die. Like, those, I think, are the only two endings to Arya's story that makes sense to me in my head. Uh, Welcome, Samantha, to the chat. Welcome... Uh, all. Um, Aya is looking over her shoulder, she's anxious, she's scared, and she's grabbing Needle's hilt at every noise. Um, so Aya is beginning to rely on her weaponry and on violence as a means of protection. She just killed a person for the first time, she killed that stable boy in King's Landing recently, um, and Sirio has been training her, so... Aya's anxiety and Aya's stress is being linked to violence because that's her coping mechanism. That's her way that she protects herself. And that's in contrast to Sansa. At the same time, Sansa is in a situation of stress and Sansa is surrounded by enemies, but Sansa is using different kinds of coping mechanisms and different kinds of ways of protecting herself. She's using courtesy. She's using lies. She's using political... Uh, knowledge. She's using social skills. She's using ways of sussing out strategically the situation. That's what's going on. Um, so it's really interesting to see Sansa and Arya in parallel and how they're dealing with their situation. Kenny says that Arya needs to chill in the rills. Damn straight. Um, welcome Plams to the chat. Uh, first live. I'm glad there's I'm glad there's people in here for the first time. See, that's the good thing about being uh, completely irregular with these things. You never know when it could happen. When you least expect it, an alt Swift X could just jump out of a bush and start talking about Aya. Uh, that's where we stream from, by the way, in a bush. Got this great s- studio in 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 a in a little fern situation, little potted plant, but like a big one. It's great. Uh, you'd love it. Um, so Aya is thinking that she doesn't trust the people around her, 
Uh, all these orphan boys, all these criminals that are being taken to the Night's Watch. Arya is untrusting of people. And she's trying to hide her identity because Arya is, of course, pretending to be Ari, the orphan boy, pretending to be a boy, wearing away her identity. Uh, and so she has to sneak away to make water to go pee on her own where no one can see that she uh, is lacking a dingus. Um, and Aya describes her stealthiness as being quiet as a shadow, which is, is of course, a Syrioism, something that Syrio used to say. And it's so lovely to see Syrio's speaking pattern embedded in Aya as sort of his ghost. G ghosts are a concept that keeps coming up in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, like, one of the weirdest little lines in A Song of Ice and Fire is, is Kyburn talking about like like uh, a a woman sitting on sitting down and then leaving, but her like aura and her like scent remaining on the seat, which sounds to me like she just farted. But like the concept of a ghost is like explicitly brought up a bunch of times, uh, and and in a lot of George Martin's like earlier writing, like there's are all sorts of like hauntings and psychic resonance and like you know people leave their spirits behind when they leave a place a lot of the time. So um. That's something that's played with here, I think. Um, and anyway, so, like, in order to to go pee, Arya go, does, like, this Mission Impossible Tom Cruise situation uh, where she uh, where she climbs up a tree and then climbs from one tree to another tree to sneak above Lommy, who's on watch. And so she's, like, sneaking, like, dun, 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 like, holding her bladder, trying to, like, get over past the sentry to, to go pee somewhere. Uh, which I think would be a great movie. I would, like, it would be, like, Taken 4, except it's just about Arya, like, trying to sneak into places to pee. I think that would be great. Um, by the way, like, how hard would it be to climb up a tree and climb from tree to tree... Like, like, and this is an oak tree. Like, I'm not an oak spurt, but, like, oak trees, I don't, I don't imagine them, like, growing all that close together. Like, close enough to go from one tree to another. Like, like, those outer branches are not very, like, strong and supportive of weight. And I know I is, like, light and nimble, but, like, yeah, I agree, Plamsy. I think, unless you've got that whole sort of, like, orangutan hand feet situation... Um, I, I'm struggling to imagine climbing around that easily. Um, CMS521 says that oak trees have traction. Look, there's a lot of friction on bark. A squirrel could tell you that. I once had a great conversation with a squirrel about tree physics. Um, and, and she was telling me, like, man, like, you can, if you believe, you can walk up, like, a, not only, like, a 180 degree, like, vertical tree... Like, you can walk upside down along, like, like a tree branch, like, upside down. Because those squirrel claws, they, they, they do work. Uh, so maybe I is part squirrel. Although there is a character that Aya bumps into later called Squirrel, isn't there? Like the crying girl, I think? I don't know, we'll get to that. Anyway, so, um... I was climbing trees, she's, uh, doing her stuff. And, uh, Gendry, the bull... Uh, is uh, is being treated like someone special because the gold cloaks in the last chapter, uh, we found out that the gold cloaks want Gendry when Arya thought that they wanted uh, her, uh, and and I noticed that like you know, Arya says, oh you know the orphans are treating the bull like someone special because the queen wanted him, and and I detect a hint of jealousy in Arya's voice here because remember like Arya like she's pretty grounded and stuff, but Arya, um. She's a high-born lady, and she's used to being treated like someone who's more important than everyone else. And all of a sudden, for the first time, she's being she's hanging out with like exclusively common people without lords and servants around. Uh, and you know, I you know, we are told that Arya like hangs out with the commons and stuff sometimes before, but like this is an exceptional situation, and I think Arya is um is is maybe a little bit jealous that Gendry's being treated like a special person when Arya's being treated like. Uh, uh, an, uh, a dirty orphan boy. Uh, Soylent Green asks how far along we are. We're about halfway through page two, so I th I'd say this is a rip roaring pace. Um, no tangents. That's right, Philip. All right. So um, Gendry has a beautiful helm. He has his bull helmet, which they really should have included in the show. Like it wouldn't have been hard to make that as a prop, would it? And it's a wonderful, wonderful symbol for Gendry and how badass he is. 
Um, and uh, and Gendry often goes off to polish his helm. And there is a joke later on when um, it's something like Aya says something like, "Oh, you know, all Gendry wants to do is um, is is polish his helm and and beat swords or something." Um, and it's this wonderful, and, and it's in the context of there's like a prostitute who's like hitting on Gendry, and the prostitute's like, "Oh, Gendry isn't interested in girls," and I's like, "Oh no, he just likes beating swords and polishing helms." Uh, the joke being that it's like uh, implying like sex or masturbation or like gay whatever. Um, and so I, there's a funny the helm polishing going on. I think could be a bit of an innuendo because George Martin loves his little innuendos. Um, the helmet is in the show, Brandon says. Is it? I don't even remember. Does it just, does it just briefly appear in season two or something? Or, or in season one? I don't recall the helmet appearing. It, it could certainly be more prominent. I wish it was. Um, all right, cool. Glad to be corrected. Um, is it still around in the late? What happens to it? I'm going to have to look it up. Oh yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember now. So, so, so when Lommy dies, Lommy is carrying the helmet, um, and Aya points at Lommy and says, "Oh, you just killed Gendry because you're holding his helmet." Yeah, that makes sense. That actually is a good use of the prop, um, in the show. I think for Lommy. Anyway, um, yeah, I can totally understand that they don't want characters wearing helmets all the time, because you can't see their faces. Um, like, Sandor's helmet appeared in Season 1 for a bit, but then sort of disappeared. Anyway, Plams reckons that uh, they'll just make the helmet reappear and Gendry will wear it in the final season. Yeah, I could see that. That'd be cool. Alright, um, so... They, Gendry's hanging out, and... Uh, oh, yeah, and that helmet, like, in the books, has such a crazy history, doesn't it? Because, like, Roj ends up with it, and then he does the, like, atrocity at salt pans wearing the helm, doesn't he? Or is that, or, no, that's a hound, cl that's the hound helmet, isn't it? Yeah, no, I'm confused. Because the hound helmet has a crazy history. Like, the hound helmet ends up with, like, Lem, Lemon Cloak, and then, like, Brienne lures Jamie to Stoneheart by saying that the hound is there, and, 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 and Lem is wearing the hound's helmet. So, like, it'll actually have, like, a plot relevance, I suppose. Lots of helmet talk in this series. Anyway, um, so Lommy and some of the orphans are talking about uh, about Gendry. And Lommy says that, oh, I think Gendry is the bastard of that traitor, the wolf lord who they killed at Baylor's Sept. Which I think is a great... Um, which I think is a great demonstration of how the small folk don't know shit. Like all these, like you know, like we're seeing the story from the perspective of no of lords and and ladies and noble people who are like the most informed people in this world. Um, we got to remember that like the ninety nine percent of people in this country only get like second, third, fourth, fifth hand rumors and hearsay about what's really going on. So I always love those scenes where like you know Davos is in the pub or whatever and he's hearing these people saying, "Oh, a three-headed dragon was born in Marine and 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 a kraken got married to Barbary Dustin." And there's all these just like ridiculous rumors flying around, which is always fun. A lot of fake news in Westeros. Um and Arya, of course, sticks up for Ned and and says that, oh, you know, my father only had one bastard, and that's John. So Arya's loyalty to Ned and John remains strong. Um, and Arya is riding a horse, and she says she's a good rider, and if she wanted to, she could ride off and leave these people behind. And she's tempted, but she figures she's more safe staying with these people because there's, you know, there's guards and there's supplies and all of that. So she figures she's safer together than alone. But of course, a lot of what happens in Aya's arc is about teaching her that, hey, um, being with people is not helping her to be safe. Um, because, you know, Yorin, of course, gets killed and, you know, people fail her. The Hound fails to get her to her family and the Brotherhood Without Banners failed to get her with her family. And Aya increasingly thinks that she's safer to look after herself and to be no one and to be self-sufficient and to be a killer and I, and, and I think what Aya's uh, arc later on will be, 
and what I think it is meant, trying to be in the show is about that idea of the lone wolf dies, but the but the pack survives. So uh, you know, perhaps it's about Arya rehabilitating and getting back with her family, getting back with the Starks, uh, and learning the 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 possibility of of working with people and relying on people again instead of being a lone wolf. Or maybe she'll fail to achieve that and she'll die, with needle locked tight between her frozen fingers. Um, let's roll on to page three. We are we are killing it. We, this is this whew, blazing speed. Um, they mention the God's Eye, that that lake uh, in the Riverlands near Harrenhal, um, which is of course a very important location because it's because that is. Uh, I mean, Harrenhal's obviously important, but it was apparently not ten leagues from Harrenhal, so near the God's Eye, where Rhaegar quote unquote abducted Lyanna. Uh, and that marriage that we see in season seven of the show, um, I think that marriage took place in the books, and I think it probably took place at the God's Eye, if only because, like, it's right near Harrenhal, where Rhaegar and Lyanna, you know, hooked up, uh, but also the God's Eye happens to have all these weirwoods on it, and, uh, Bran's green sight can see through weirwoods, so if Rhaegar and Lyanna's marriage happened at the God's Eye, Bran could easily see that marriage there, and then he could report to John or whoever. Um, and the God's Eye is also important because it's got, like, the green men on it, and, like, that's where the pact happened, and it's, like, all this, like, ancient old gods magic happening on the God's Eye. And I think we'll get a taste of that one way or another. Um, Doomsday says the Hound's Helmet deserves a video. And, yeah, you totally could. Like, the Hound's Helmet is, like, as complex a character um as 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 a lot of others so um uh yeah no that, that could totally happen uh all right so they're going near the god's eye but they're taking the the long way around to avoid the gold cloaks uh and we get some more descriptions of the land farmland and forest and hills and valleys uh we get the inevitable <clears throat> food description um we got some oh man we got some salt fish some hard bread we got some lard you got to get some lard in you. Like, lard is one of the five food groups. Like, what is it? You know, it's protein, it's carbohydrates, it's Snickers, it's lard. Like, you got to, like, get some, oof, tasty lard. Uh, and turnips. <laughs> and sacks of beans and barley. And wheels of yellow cheese. Well, that well, those are the supplies that they did have, but now all that food's been eaten. So now they're being forced to live off the land. Um, and there's a couple of poachers... Uh, in this group of Night's Watch recruits called Koss and Kurz. And you just know that these guys are red shirts who are going to die because of how bad their names are. Koss and Kurz are not the most inspired names that George Martin has come up with. Uh, anyone with a bad name, you just know, is not going to last all that long. And also, like, I, I think it's cool how, uh, you know, these poachers, these criminals... Uh, the skills from their crime are helping the Night's Watch... Um, like, you know, you, you have all these brutal murderers and you have all these, um, smart talkers like Saturn and you've got all these, you know, bastards like John and you've got all these nerdy wimps like Sam, like all these different, like, outcasts and criminals and, and, you know, scum of Westeros, like the things that make them criminals and scum are the things that make them of benefit to the Night's Watch. And so it's kind of like a perfect institution in that respect. Like it takes people's weaknesses and vices and transforms them into virtues. And I think that's what a society should do. Like it should find ways to 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 make good and make benefit out of uh, the things that would otherwise be harmful. Uh, and I think that's, uh, to get hashtag topical, something that, like, you know, the prison system fails to do. How does the prison system, you know, make something good out of out of people's uh, misfortunes and, 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 and skills and whatever, you know? Um, uh, uh, there's talk of bears balls in the chat. What on earth is happening? Anyway... Um, so, uh, Koss and Kurz are, are poachers and they're hunting and they're getting a bunch of deer and quail and such, uh, blackberries and apples. Uh, Aya is a skilled climber and a fast picker of fruit and she catches a rabbit. Uh, she just hits it with a stick and, uh, and they get to eat the rabbit. Um, uh, rabbits are actually like, um, two times, 
vulnerable to stick damage. Little known, little known fact. Do you guys know the YouTube channel Tear Zoo? <laughs> you guys should watch Tear Zoo. Um, anyway, so uh, so yeah, Aya does a critical hit on the rabbit, and uh, it is delicious by all accounts. And uh, Roj makes fun of Aya and says, "Oh, you're a hunter. You're a lumpy faced, lumpy head rabbit killer." Aya is stacking up the t- the names, the titles, the epithets, epithets. Um, so, uh, so they, uh, so, which I think is part of Aya's, you know, loss of identity and so on. And then anyway, some, some farmers, some field hands surround, uh, Yoren's group in a holdfast called Briar White, and they hold scythes, and they demand money for the, for the corn that was taken by Yoren's group. And Yoren complains that, oh man, back in the day... Uh, the Night's Watch was welcomed and feasted from dawn to Winterfell, and High Lords called it an honor. Like you know, people would just people would just throw food and money and 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 designer handbags at us because we were just the shit, man. Everyone loved us, asking for autographs, just throwing confetti wherever we go. Real ecological nightmare confetti because it really gums up the waterways and everything. But that's how much people loved the Night's Watch. Just just parties wherever we were going. Uh, just, just buffets, just, just chocolate, uh, uh, fondue fountains. Like, people are just loving it when the Night's Watch rolled into town. But alas, not anymore. And I do wonder if Yorin is exaggerating that. Like, the Night's Watch has certainly declined in, in honor. But, like, has it declined that much in the last 30 years, specifically, during which Yorin has been an adult, you know? Um, or is Yorin just doing the classic old man thing of just looking back at the past with the rose tinted glasses and saying, ah, you know, everything was better in the past. Um, I think Yorin might be doing a bit of that, bit of complaining, bit of exaggerating. And, and you know, also like, you know, like the, isn't the Night's Watch just crazy? Like this is supposedly an 8,000 year old institution, right? Like the Night's Watch was supposedly founded uh when the white walkers were defeated after the long night 8000 years ago and you know maybe the timeline's off maybe it was only 4000 years ago i don't know um but 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 like how like come on like what what is the oldest continuous institution in the real world like what i don't know like 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 the catholic church maybe i don't know hit, hit me in the comments what is the oldest like continuous organization um uh, what what could it be? It's got to be religions, right? Like what what I guess. Oh, um, the the Japanese imperial family, maybe. Uh, or 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 like or like the British crown or something like some kind of dynasty or government. Um, the the Judaism. Well, Judaism isn't like an institution, is it? Schubert says Nintendo. Nintendo was founded. Uh very long time ago um in uh in uh i'll just be offensive if i try and rip that vegans i i I think herbivores are definitely older than catholicism i would say but yeah it's probably a religion isn't it so like the night's watch and and the night's watch is a lot like the night's watch is a lot like a religion because they've got like their vows like they're old it's almost like a prayer that they don't really um, that they don't really understand the meaning of. It's just got sort of like religious significance and it's got this sort of sense of duty and all these traditions and it's got special clothes and it's got ranks and hierarchies and, and, and it's got like a founding myth. The Night's Watch is a lot like a religion. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, I just think it's crazy that the Night's Watch is a thing, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and someone in the chat pointed out that, yeah, I think maybe the decline that Euron's talking about is more the fact that, you know, in this time of war, everyone's really stingy with the Night's Watch. But I dare say that, like, you know, people are pretty dismissive of the Night's Watch, even, like, before the War of the Five Kings in recent times. Um, That certainly has changed by most accounts. Um, Okay, so they face off with these field hands, and ultimately Euron just chucks them some coppers. Uh, and they and they eat the corn, which, by the way, why the fuck is corn called ears? Can someone explain that to me? Why why are there ears of corn? I don't get it. Um, but uh, but Yorin does not enjoy his ears uh, because he's too angry to eat. A cloud seems to hang over him, and he mutters to himself. Yorin is a man of unresolved grievances. 
I would say. He is someone with, with beef, old spoiled beef that he is not happy about. Um, and I think those grievances are part of what leads to his end. You don't want to die with regrets, but I think Yoren does. Um, Plam says that it's called a, an ear of corn because a nose of corn doesn't sound as tasty. Um, that That is sound reasoning, if ever I've read it. Uh, but, yeah, so they're hanging, they're eating, they're earing, they're doing this and that. And then the poacher, Koss, comes back and he's like, yo, I saw some, some men, 20 or 30 men, up ahead on the road, and, uh, and they're like soldiers. And they seem to have been fighting because one of them's dying. And Yorin's like, well, what's their heraldry? They like the good side, they like the bad side, like, well, how are we, how are we hanging with these fellas? And, uh, and he says, their heraldry is a spotted tree cat yellow and black, which is a pretty fucking obscure house. Uh, according to the wiki, this is House Myatt with the spotted tree cat, and they're sworn to House Lannister, but, like, we know, like, nothing about them. There are so many super minor, um, super minor houses that we hear nothing about. Like, there's hundreds of them. Um, I wonder if George, like, actually, like, keeps that much track of all of them, or if he just, like, makes one up when he feels like it. I don't know. Um, so there's a tree cat, and Yoren's like, eh, we don't know if we can trust no tree cats. Um, they, they, you know, tree cats is a general rule. Um, when they're out of their trees, they can't be trusted, I would say. Anyway, uh, so, um, so Yoren's like, no, we'll just take the long way around. We'll avoid these tree cats, uh, because they might be against us. They might try and mess with us. They might try and take our shit. So we'll take the long way around and we'll avoid them. Uh, and Yoren says, well, you know, it's fine to take the long way around because you guys are going to have time enough on the wall. Uh, it's the rest of your lives as a Night's Watchman on the wall, so there's no rush to get there. Which strikes me as incredibly grim. <laughs> the idea that, oh, you might as well waste a week because, well, the rest of your life is basically a waste on the wall, so fuck it. Like, that's basically what they're saying. Might as well waste your time here, might as well waste your time there, makes no difference. Like, that's a pretty big fucking downer. The moment when time means nothing to you is kind of the moment when life means nothing to you, because life is made of time, and so I think you got to value your time. Uh, so, they travel, and they see a man perched up in a tree, with a bow and a quiver, and he's looking suspiciously at them. And there's this there's this overwhelming sense in this chapter of 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 fear and just paranoia and stress that arises from the war. And that's something that I think the show is missing. Like the show feels a lot more like a sort of a romp where they're just sort of bouncing around the world and it's all the main characters just being bros and hanging out and doing all this cool shit and having sword fights where no one dies. Um Whereas the books, like, these travelogues are, you know, fucking interminable. But they do get across this sense that the show doesn't have of just how impactful and meaningful and horrible war is. Which is one of the real main thrusts of Game of Thrones, I think. By the way, quiver? What the fuck sort of word is quiver? Like, uh, we're really banging on the etymology drum this episode. But, like, like, like quiver. Like, why does to quiver mean to, like, tremble and shake? But it also means a sling that you keep arrows in. Like, like what, what is that about? Anyway, uh, welcome, Hedgehog, to the chat. Um, so they're heading up to the wall, and uh, and and Yorin says about the guy in the tree, "Hey, you know he's all untrusting of us. That's messed up. Let's see how that guy likes it in his tree when the others come to take him. He'll scream for the watch then. That he will." And again, there's this idea of the of the of the White Walkers, the others taking people, which I think is actually like enormously consequential. The fact that others they're not out to kill, the fact that they're out to take, they're out to assimilate, they're out to capture, to convert, to reproduce, or you know, they're out to do something other than merely destroy. The 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 phrase that others take you is repeated constantly, which I guess is sort of like a boogeyman sort of thing. But I think it is indicative of what the White Walkers are about. And the White Walkers are clearly about something more than just killing. 
Uh, Gemma in the chat compares them to the Borg. And yeah, that's an interesting comparison because the Borg in Star Trek are like the people who assimilate everyone into identical hive mind homogenous robo-kin. Ro- robo and uh, maybe the others are trying to do something similar. Although, like, you know, seems like a bit of a design oversight by the Children of the Forest doesn't it? Because the Children of the Forest supposedly, at least in the show, created the White Walkers as a weapon to kill humans. What did? What was the children's plan if every dead human is another White Walker? Like, what were the children going to do with the, with the millions of White Walkers after they've killed all the humans? Did they expect the White Walkers to just happily extinguish themselves? What exactly was the plan? I suspect we'll never know. Uh, Misty is leaving the chat. Thank you for joining in. Thanks for listening. I agree, Plams, that the others sound more spooky. The name Others is scarier than White Walker. Much more spooky, but um, it is a lot more grammatically confusing. I think it is totally the right move that the show decided to just exclusively call them White Walkers. Um... And so they see the bloke in the tree, and then they see fire to the north. Uh, because a bunch of soldiers are burning down a town is what's happening. I'm not sure if this is meant to be like Gregor Clegane's pals that are burning down this town because Tywin told him to reeve and destroy, uh, or if it's maybe the the tree cat fellas that we saw before. But someone's burning down this town, which we see a lot of that shit in uh, in the war torn Riverlands, and uh, and so the fire seems to grow brighter and brighter as the world darkens as night happens. Um, and the world darkening is literal and metaphorical, I think. Uh, and none of them sleep very well that night. So again, we're constantly reminded of this sense of discomfort, anxiety, danger. Um, and they go north and they say that the fields are a charred desolate desolation. There are carcasses, not only of humans, but also of animals. And somehow, I mean, human corpses are upsetting, but the animal corpses are in a way almost more perverse because like, Killing a human can be justified as, you know, killing an enemy, right? But killing an animal, that doesn't help anyone in any way. By killing an animal, you're only doing that to deny someone else a resource, denying someone else a meal. It doesn't it doesn't actually help you to do that. It's like a, it's like a net loss, you know? Like, at, at least killing an enemy soldier can be seen as an advantage to you. Killing an animal is a real fuck you to everyone involved. It's a lose-lose-lose. For you, your enemy, and the bloody cow. Um, he, animals are always the fucking losing side in every conflict. I mean, it's like the, you know, it's like Jorah says that, oh, uh, you know, uh, or someone says that, like, oh, you know, when, when, when the High Lords fight their wars, it's always the animals. It, no, sorry, it's always, it's always the small folk that lose. But I think that's true of the animals. Uh, I think, I, I think low key, if we want to get, if we want to get all fucking real. I think I think treatment of animals is like probably the most unethical thing that happens in the world right now. Like human suffering is is enormous, but animal suffering is just times a hundred. Like the number of animals in like meat factories and abattoirs and even just like pets that aren't treated as well as they should and just also animals in nature. Like that's the bit that fucks with me. Like every day there are millions of animals suffering from disease, suffering from death, being mangled and injured and starving and shivering and fearing and just awful awful things happening to creatures that feel and think and want. And that and and that's that's nature. <laughs> Like that's when nature is working as intended. That's that that's even without human, even without human intervention, billions of animals are suffering constantly. Like I think it's an interesting argument that to say that oh well, if we actually wanted to minimize suffering, we should actually extinguish nature. We could actually just kill all animals because then there would be less net suffering. Which no one would advocate, right? No one should say that we should just make all animals extinct because there's too much suffering in nature, but there is so much suffering in nature. So how can we resolve that paradox? You know, I, I, we have this rosy picture of the natural world. We, we, we think that nature is natural and human animal suffering is caused by humans. And a lot of it is, but, 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 but damn, you know, uh, nature's rough too. I don't like, like if someone decided to invent nature, if someone decided to invent the ecosystem where animals are constantly eating each other and fighting and struggling to survive, 
No one would approve that. Like, like, like the the ecosystem would never get past an ethics committee. Uh, but it exists, and now we gotta fucking decide what's right. You know, it's rough. We didn't sign up for this shit. Anyway, uh, no tangents. Um. Stephanie says that the aliens killed all life and stored their genetic DNA in a library until they could do things better. Is, is it, are you saying that's what Earth is? Earth is like a genetic DNA library? Are we like Mark 1? Are we like beta of like what the real Earth is going to be? Yeah, no, for real. The ecosystem is animal cruelty. It's fucked up. We just got to make every animal like a pampered pet or just not exist. Like it's just it's just one or the other. I don't know. Um, shit's rough, man. Anyway, so uh, so this place burned down, and they go and investigate the burned down place. And yeah, it's really gnarly. Like, there are human corpses impaled on sharpened stakes. And Yorin and a couple of blokes called Merch and Cutjack, another couple of redcoats, they go and investigate the town, and they come out later carrying uh, a woman and a girl. And the girl is two years old and she's crying constantly and the woman uh her right arm ends in a bloody stump and her eyes don't seem to see anything and when she talks she only says please 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 over and over um and there are just so many descriptions of these just little vignettes of human suffering um throughout the story that just just I don't know, it, it almost feels gratuitous, like, it almost feels like, like, torture porn or horror porn or something, like, like, George finds so many inventive ways to just show us suffering, um, and it's just, uh, like, you know, I, I think his argument, like, in his interviews, he's always saying that, you know, this is the reality of war. The reality of war is that people get fucked up, um, and you gotta show that, and I suppose that's legit, but I mean, it's also the truth that people... Uh, uh, you know, shit and do their taxes, and George doesn't show that, except Danny and dance. <laughs> People love that. Uh, those lines in uh in a Dance with the Dragons about Daenerys, where uh, what's the line? The more she drank, the more she shat. I think that is good. That you know, the 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 dragon queen, the most beautiful woman in the world, the the queen of the Roinar and the Andals and 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 all that. We see her, her shooting her guts out in, in the Dothraki Sea. I think that is a very sort of grounding, humbling kind of spirit quest. Anyway, so we see all this horror, and, and the reaction of Roj and Baita to these s suffering, th this woman and this girl, is to laugh at them. Roj thinks it's funny, this armless woman saying, please, 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 and they laugh. And, like, that feels a bit cartoonish to me. Um, I find it hard to imagine someone who sees that level of horror and trauma and reacts by, by laughing and making fun of it. And, you know, I suppose the idea is that, you know, some people would react like that as, like, a coping mechanism and, like, you know, they react by being callous and, and making mock because that's just how they deal with trauma and awfulness. Um, and... I, I, I guess, but I don't know, it's never, I, uh, maybe that's just my failure of imagination, like Elena Tyrell, but I, I struggle to see people being quite that awful, or at least so many of them, you know, w Westworld feels full of, like, people who are just, like, torturing for shits and giggles, and, like, you know, like, 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 that makes sense maybe in terms of, like, an institution, like, in the context of, I guess this is a context of war, but I don't know. I I like to think people aren't quite that bad. Um, Plams says that the Theon torture scene in Game of Thrones uh, helped Plams understand how torture, how bad torture is. Yeah, well, I think like the animal world, torture is something that's like just massively underappreciated how fucked it is. Uh, I think the levels of suffering and pain that... that are possible is just so far beyond what most people can imagine and i think that like torture should be something that is like so taboo to the point of just not being conceivable i think if we lived in any kind of sane world but i don't know anything um so in this in the face of this awfulness and this suffering hot pie says i'm scared and aya says me too uh and he squeezes her shoulder and and 
Hot Pie confesses that his boasts before about kicking a boy to death isn't true. And so they have this, like, beautiful shared moment of vulnerability and supporting each other, which is great, because Aya gets so little of that. Um, and it's a great moment of, you know, human contact and friendship that Aya gets so little of. But, of course, that all sort of sours when, you know, Hot Pie leaves Aya, and Aya feels abandoned by Hot Pie um, when when he later leaves her. And so this, so like, like this whole thing, like it's almost like, like this chapter has Aya actually relying on people and relating to people in a way that she usually doesn't, which I think is almost there just to set her up for the fall when, you know, Yoren's party fails and these friendships break up and Aya just feels all the more alienated by that after having been connected to not being. Uh, and then we get a weird story about, Aya recalls this story that old Nan told about how a man was imprisoned in a, in a dark castle by evil giants, and then he was smart, and he escaped, but then he got outside the castle, and then the White Walkers took him and drank his hot red blood. Which is weird, isn't it? We get all these little odd stories about the White Walkers, which are more sort of like general boogeyman stories, I suppose. Um, like, you know, why would White Walkers drink the hot red blood of humans? That doesn't seem like something that they would actually do. Um, but, um, you know, what do they want? They want the life force, they want human sacrifice, they want to make more White Walkers. It's hard to square that little story with what we know about the White Walkers. Uh, and, and, the, and the evil giants? I don't know. Are they meant to be, like, giant giants? Like the ones that we see in the north? Maybe some of Old Nan's stories are not, uh, all that, mm, all that literal, uh, because the point of this story, I think, is meant to be about hopelessness. It's about, um, it's about no matter what this person in this story does, they still get killed in the end. And I think that's, that, that sense of hopelessness is what I is feeling out in the war-torn riverlands. Um, so, yeah, inescapability. Um, so, the one-eyed woman dies, and they dig a grave for her. And, uh, and it's on a hillside by a weeping willow. And when the wind blows, Aya thinks she can hear the branches whispering, please, please, please. So it's almost like this woman's ghost and her life force and her soul entered the trees. Just like weirwoods store, like, the souls and the energy of dead people, uh, in the north, apparently. Like, the children of the forest and all that go into their trees, and skin changes and wargs go into the trees. So, you know, maybe that's not, like, literally happening here, but the idea of trees being, like, ghosts uh, is is definitely a recurring idea, so it appears here. Um, and, uh, and they have dinner, and they drink the water of a river, and it has a funny taste, maybe because of bodies rotting somewhere upstream, Lomi suggests. But then Hot Pie hits Lomi for suggesting something so upsetting. And, you know, I guess that's another example of a, you know defense mechanism. Hot Pie hears something that upsets him and disturbs him, so his reaction is to hit Lommy. You know, if you hear an idea you don't like, try hitting it until it goes away. It always works. Then everyone goes to sleep, and Rorge snores and Biter hisses. Those are the sounds that they're trying to go to sleep to. Um, and they... and Yorin is sitting there sharpening his knife and then Aya needs to go pee because she drank too much corpse water. Corpse water. It's full of nutrients, man. It's good for you. It's almost as good as vitamin water. Um, and Aya has to get past Hot Pie, who's on sentry duty. Um, and she has to trick Hot Pie in order to get past him. She has to lie and, like, because, you know, she's trying to hide the fact that she's a girl and all of that. Um... <laughs> Jay says, uh, hitting Lommy is always the answer. There are no problems that can't be solved by hitting Lommy, I would say. Um, anyway, so Aya has to, like, trick Hot Pie to get past him, which is just a tiny little thing, but I think it's, like, a nice sort of microcosm representation of how, like, Aya, Aya's need to survive is, like, du in direct opposition to Aya's, uh, need to connect with people. Like, like, Aya needs to lie and cheat and sneak in order to get past Hot Pie, this person who just had this tender moment with. Um, survival is linked with alienation for Aya. Everything that she does to protect herself separates her from others. 
And I think that's this paradoxical dichotomy. Like, like people want to rely on each other, but they also want to serve their own interests. And so often, all too, all too, all too often, uh, those two needs are opposed. Uh, so she sneaks past, and then she encounters some wo- some wolves. And can you imagine that? Like, she's literally, like, squatting with her pants down, and she sees the glowing eyes of two, four, eight, twelve, a whole pack of wolves. Um, like, I would piss myself in fear, but I is already pissing. Um, and Aya for a moment thinks, oh, fuck, I'm gonna die. Uh, she thinks that they're gonna find her half-eaten body the next morning. Which is kind of a similar line to the description of, uh, Finding Arya's body frozen in the snow when 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 spring comes when John says back in a Game of Thrones, um, there seem to be a lot of like very graphic de- de- descriptions of Arya's death in this series, which you know call me crazy, but that leads me leads me to believe that Arya might die, given how many death descriptions we get. Anyway, um, but the wolves approach Arya and she's like, shit, I'm gonna get myself wolfed. Uh, but then the wolves just leave, and leave her alone. Uh, which maybe is, like, maybe those wolves are part of Nymeria's pack, because, of course, I, as direwolf Nymeria, um, gathers this great wolf pack and, and is probably disinclined to eat Aya for that reason. Uh, but Aya is shaken, and she, and she's afraid, and she's sad to think about Nymeria. There's a lot of descriptions of, like, Aya's emotional vulnerability in, in these books that we get a lot less of in the later books, because when Aya joins with the faceless men and becomes no one, she becomes a lot more emotionally detached. Part of why she joins the faceless men is because she wants to be emotionally detached, uh, from the trauma she's suffered. Uh, and so there's, so, so there's a lot of, you know, contrast with that here, with all this, like, frank description of Aya's feelings. Um, and she tells Yorin that she saw wolves, and Yorin says, oh, seems to me your kind was fond of wolves. So there is an ancient connection between Starks and wolves, which, which they know about. Which, by the way, is like, like, uh, it's interesting, this idea of a, co- of a connection between the ancient House Stark and the White Walkers. I think that there's evidence in the crypts of Winterfell to hint that the Kings of Winter are connected to the White Walkers, uh, if only because they carry iron longswords on their laps to to lock the spirits, the vengeful spirits in the crypts, when Old Nan says that iron is specifically something that White Walkers don't like. Uh, and it seems plausible that the Night's King, who Old Nan to- told us is a Stark, uh, who gave his seed and his soul to something that seems like a White Walker. Uh, the point is that uh, there are hints that make it seem like the Starks might have the blood of White Walkers in them, possibly, or something like it. And I find that sort of a little bit difficult to reconcile with the idea that the Starks also have warg blood and wolf blood in them. Like, a Stark's a mix of ice and wolf and green seer, and now John has this Targaryen dragon blood as well. Like, there's all sorts of, like, you know, I don't know how genetics is meant to work in Game of Thrones, but it's pretty fruity and it's pretty magical and it's pretty bloody. And uh, the Starks are just full of it. Um, so uh, Arya encounters the wolves and um, Arya talks about uh, Nymeria and her father. But then Yorin says, uh, Ari, orphan boys don't got no fathers. So Yorin is reminding Aya that she's not Aya, she's no one. So this is about Aya losing her identity. Um, and and Yorin is chewing this sour leaf, uh, this, this like chewing tobacco or whatever, and it makes his spit red, so it looks like his mouth is bleeding. Uh, which, which maybe in some metaphorical sense alludes to Yorin's wounds, metaphorical or otherwise. I think Yorin is a very sort of hurt person. I would read a prequel about Yorin. Uh, I think that would be cool. Uh, I reckon Yorin would have seen all sorts of shit in his travels around Westeros as a recruiter for the Night's Watch. Uh, but yeah, so so Arya is fearing, feeling vulnerable. She's miserable. She's trying so hard to be brave and fierce, but sometimes she feels like she's just a little girl. Um, which, you know, you would. Um, and Yorin thinks, well, maybe I should have just left you in King's Landing. Maybe you would have been safer in King's Landing than you are on the road. And he might be right. Um, 
And Yorin even thinks that, well, if I was really clever, like, we should have just taken a ship up to the wall. Instead of walking all the way up the King's Road, should have just taken a ship, would have been safer. Um, if I was a clever man, that's what I would have done. But for 30 years, I've been taking this King's Road. Which is a weird sort of resigned sense from Yorin. Like, Yorin is saying that, well, looks like I took the more dangerous bad decision, but, well, this is how I've always done it. Like, Yorin seems resigned to the danger that, and the risk that he's putting himself in. Um, and, I, and, 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 you know, certainly from when Yorin dies next chapter, spoilers, um, you do get the sense that Yorin is committing suicide by Lannister to some extent. Like, Yorin could have yielded, but he's defiant instead, which just puts him in unnecessary danger. It, it's almost as though Yorin feels so overwhelmed with his failures and his regrets and his bitterness and his anger over the treatment of the Night's Watch that Yorin, in a sense, sort of wants to die. It's like this archetype that we get a lot of. Like, George really likes this idea of uh, men in the North uh, going off, quote-unquote, hunting when they're just going off to die because they're all done men and they want to help their family by by just having another... Uh, one less mouth to feed. Like, George George seems to love this idea of, like, the older generation just choosing to walk off and curl up and die. Um, which, I guess, is like, you know, like a seasonal thing. You know, he always links it to the season. Like, winter is a time to, to, to let go of the old and to make room for the new. And I think Yorin is, is definitely representative of the old and the done. And I think we get that sense strongly here. Uh, and soon enough, he does indeed die. And so, Arya, or should we call her Ari, or should we call Rabbit Killer Lumpy Face, she goes to sleep in her thin blanket, and she hears the wolves howling. But she also see she also hears a fainter sound, a whisper on the wind that might have been screams. Which I think sort of evokes the, the, you know, the idea of ghosts, you know, there are dead people in the trees, there are dead people in the wolves, there are warg spirits in the wolves, there are warg spirits in the trees. Uh, it also reminds me of that screaming bear in the movie Annihilation, which has got to be one of the most upsetting horror creatures of recent years. But that's the final line of the chapter. Uh, this sense of wolves and screams and discomfort and it's interesting that Arya here is disturbed by the wolves when in future chapters Arya embraces the wolves as a symbol of her stark heritage and her strength and she starts warging into the wolves and having a night her her, her night wolf dreams so Arya takes something that's that's a source of fear and she turns it into a strength um which is that's that's adaptation that's finding ways to survive, but there are also costs to that kind of adaptation, um, which we see in Aya's slow, interminable dehumanization. So that is the, the, the grim note that this chapter ends on. It's sort of a dark, scenic travelogue, is I think what this chapter is. Uh, very little happens, but I think it does help to add characterization to Yorin, and, and most importantly, uh, the themes of Arya's arc in terms of her alienation, in terms of her adaptation, in, in terms of her fear and stress. Um, and I also am fond of the idea that this is representative of George Martin's slow, meandering, inefficient writing pace. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining into this episode of A Cocker Bridge, the, the, probably the best a cocker bridged on the internet, I would say. Uh, we got an appearance by Wet Dick Daddy in the chat. He says, good chapter. Uh, sorry if I just assumed your gender. Um, but uh, cheers. Thanks, you all, for coming down. Uh, if you want to if you wanna chuck this podcast a cheeky five stars on iTunes, that would be cool, because that's what all the cool kids say at the end of podcasts. Uh, this is a podcast, by the way. Like, you can watch it on YouTube, but you can also subscribe on the podcast app of your choice. Uh, I don't know if, if you know this, but all the cool kids are listening to podcasts. There are a zillion cool podcasts that you should listen to. Um, and, uh, and, and some of them are like true crime, and some of them are like uh, creative fiction, and some of them are like news, and some of them are like... 
Uh, podcasts deliberately designed to be so boring that they put you to sleep. That's a pretty good one. Sleep with me. Um, yeah, <laughs> we're doing a podcast without a Blue Apron sponsorship, which I didn't know if that was even possible. But, uh, uh, yeah, Advance says there's a new round of the giveaway. All you have to do to enter is to leave, be a subscriber and le- leave the comment and, and, yeah, oh boy. Uh, but yeah, podcasts are like the gateway drug into, um, into more podcasts, so make sure you get onto that. And, uh, otherwise, cheers, thanks for listening, uh, we're gonna continue to do, uh, Old Shift X episodes when you least expect it, um... And uh, and I hope you have a good time and don't think too much about the existential horror of uh, the animal world or human evil. Otherwise, uh, have a good one. Cheers.